Year 10 and 11, welcome to your analysis of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, the context and chapters 1 through to 3 in preparation for your English Literature exam. Preparing for the assessment. Your assessment objectives are EO1, EO2, EO3 and EO4. EO1, as you can see, assesses your ability to read, understand and respond to the texts. That means you have a personal response which is developed and critical. You can use quotations to support your interpretation. Therefore, you should think about how well you know what happens, what the characters say, what you think are the key ideas or what you think about the key ideas, how to support your viewpoints in terms of the quotations you use. EOT, uh, e, sorry, EO2 is your ability to analyse language, form and structure. So the how the writer creates meaning and effect. And here, we really need the right language terminology. So what specifically does the writer do? His words, his phrases, his paragraphs. What choices has Robert Louis Stevenson made? And what effect do they create? Suspense? laughter do you reflect I don't know you need to think about the choices he makes in terms of his language and in terms of his structure EO3 is showing an understanding of the relationship between texts and the context in which they were written so we need to think about society the society that is used by Robert Louis Stevenson what does this book tell us about attitudes to science in Stevenson's day what was, science, what was society like in Stevenson's day and how does he show that in the story? And finally, A04 is your, you, your use of vocabulary, sentence structure, clarity, purpose, effect, and they check spelling and punctuation here. So basically, how accurate are you in your writing? So that is how you will be assessed. Okay, so Stevenson's life. He was born in Edinburgh in 1850 and Edinburgh had a very famous medical school and the doctors who trained there were considered to be the best in Britain. And Robert Louis Stevenson would have known this and therefore the Sawbones, who attends the trampled girl at the beginning of the novella, has a strong Edinburgh accent. Stevenson studied law at university, which is a good foundation for the character of Utterson. And he became an atheist and he gave up religion and this caused him to quarrel and fight and disagree with his father. Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde deals with issues that are a problem within the Christian church. For example, the nature of evil and why people do bad things. London. Stevenson uses two well-known features of London. Number one, they were rich people but also very poor people living in overcrowded filthy conditions. Lanyon and Jekyll's house are both in respectable areas but the rooms Jekyll has rented for Hyde are in a poor neighbourhood. So straight away we have the duality of Jekyll shown in the building. Number two, London experienced thick, dark fog which rose from the River Thames and mixed with smoke and soot from the coal fires burning in the city. And it would have been very difficult to see. Stevenson uses the fog to create a dark atmosphere. The fog could even get into buildings, much like it does when it gets into Jekyll's cabinet. So setting is key. Religion and science. And I shall go into more detail about science in a second. In 1859, Charles Darwin published The Origin of the Species. And this book became famous for introducing the theory of evolution. Many people saw it as an attack on religion. Darwin put forward the theory that all life, including humans, had evolved from more primitive forms. The book was released when people were struggling to agree on religion, science and the supernatural. 
Many people believed science had become dangerous and was interfering with God. And this is what Jekyll does in the novel. More detail about science then. Feel free to stop the video because there's a few things here that you may want to make notes on. So, great advances had been made in the 19th century and they changed the way people thought about the world and the nature of human beings. This is explored in the novel in various ways. So first of all, we've got Darwin's theory of evolution. It stated that humans evolved from other animals and were not created by God. The idea that humans were a type of animal was difficult for people to accept and challenged their views of what it is to be human. And this uncertainty is used by Stevenson. Then we've got advances in chemistry and biology and this focused on how the body works and how chemicals work and how the chemicals work on humans. Pharmacology had developed as a new science. So Jekyll's development of his portion reflects this. Psychology had also only just emerged and this focused on the mind and how it interacts with the body. Again, an interest of Dr. Jekyll. We've also got graphology, graphology, which became popular at the time. And this claims to reveal aspects of personality from handwriting. Remember, this is not a real science, but in the novel, Stevenson uses it to show that Jekyll is not mad and that his handwriting is similar to Hyde's. And then we've got another artificial science, so a, a science that isn't really real, and that's physio, physiognomy, sorry. And this is the idea that we can learn about someone's character from what they look like. So Stevenson makes Hyde physically repulsive, doesn't he? Especially in the opening scenes. And this appearance shows evil. So Johann Kasper Lavata, I hope I've pronounced that right, but I probably haven't, um, made this popular. And he believed a relationship existed between the soul and the body, which is voiced by Jekyll. Quote, the mere aura and effulgence of certain of the powers that made up my spirit. So again, take note, we've got the theory of evolution here. Advances in chemistry and biology, psychology, graphology and physiognomy. So again, they all make up and are intertwined within the novella. So make sure that you understand this in terms of what you could see in the exam. We've also got the law as a theme and Utterson is a lawyer. And he keeps the legal documents involved in the case as well as Jekyll's will. And Jekyll's will is central to the novella. And it is the will that makes Utterson suspicious. So parts of the story are recorded in formal legal documents which generically record the truth. For example, Lanyon's witness account and Jekyll's statement both, excuse me, I've put Bith instead of both, I apologise, both give the story a sense of legitimacy. Newcomen represents another aspect of the law, but one which is unsuccessful in dealing with the events. Apologies for my typing error there. We must also understand the influence of Gothic literature on the novella. So Gothic literature began in the 18th century. You had things like Frankenstein and later on Dracula. Gothic novels deal with human experience and more, more specifically it's horror, madness and extreme emotions like despair and passion. And Jekyll and Hyde obviously falls into this genre. Jekyll and Lanyon go mad with despair and horror at what Jekyll has done. The supernatural element comes from the separation of parts of Jekyll's personality achieved through a paranormal transformation. And we have gothic settings which are dark and mysterious. mysterious. And the novella is set in London, which we know is dark and covered in fog, quote, district of some city in a nightmare. So again, when we're referring to the novella, whether it be setting or theme, consider gothic literature. 
one of the biggest themes in the novella is the is nature versus the supernatural so the natural and the supernatural and this is the idea that humans have a dual nature they saw the rational everyday normality of family life and employment but also fantasies nightmares anger and violence so basically it was the explainable versus the inexplicable the natural versus the supernatural more basic good versus evil and we we know that the whole novella explores duality so these things will be cropping up as we analyze each chapter don't forget i'm going to be analyzing chapter one two and three in a couple of minutes this is just a basic introduction to voice. The different characters in the novella have different voices that reflect their personalities and concerns. Jekyll speaks in a rich, extravagant way. He uses imagery and emotionally loaded words which suit his interest in science. Whereas Lanyon speaks precisely and uses a lot of factual details and is not one to embellish or use imagery. And this suits his character as a practical scientist. And also Utterson. Utterson speaks in formal sentences and avoids simplistic words in favour of more complicated ones. And this formal speaks, uh, speak, sorry, reflects his character and profession as a lawyer. I'm going to move now on to chapter one. So again, pause the video where you need. So what happens in chapter one is basically this. Mr. Utterson is introduced and he's taken his usual Sunday walk with his friend, his relative even, Mr. Enfield. And it's in a well-kept street and they see a battered door and this leads Enfield to tell Utterson about this experience he's just had. Late at night, Enfield sees a short man run into and trample a small girl and he shouted to stop the man and raise the alarm. Now, the girl wasn't hurt particularly, but the crowd who disliked the short man made him give the girl's family money and he agreed to give her, give her and the family £100. The man led the crowd to a battered door. He went inside and came out with gold and a cheque which was signed by a respectable citizen. Enfield doesn't name the citizen, but Enfield assumes Hyde was blackmail blackmailing the person who signed the cheque. It is revealed that the short man's name is Hyde and also Enfield reveals that he is disturbing. The importance of the chapter is as follows. It introduces us to Utterson and we will see a lot of action from his perspective. Hyde is also introduced via Enfield's narration and we see him being violent and everyone finds him repulsive. And we also see the setting of London with a rundown door that is Hyde's usual way into Jekyll's laboratory. Most readers will already know the secret behind Jekyll and Hyde before they read the book. Stevenson's novel does not reveal this secret until the end. And he presents us with what seems like a detective novel, beginning with a sinister figure, an act of violence and hints of blackmail. The opening scene contains supernatural elements, particularly in the strange dread that Hyde inspires. As I said earlier, the whole crowd, everyone finds him repulsive. We are introduced to the proper respectable Victorian attitudes of Enfield and Utterson because they are described as reserved and they avoid Gossiping. Quotation. Let us make a bargain never to refer to this again. The Victorian value system largely privileged reputation over reality. And this is reflected in the narrator's remarks about Utterson and Enfield. And in the character's own remarks about gossip and blackmail. In a society so focused on reputation, blackmail proves to be powerful. People would do anything to keep their reputation and this is shown when the crowd blackmail Hyde and he pays the family off. Hyde's access to a respectable man's bank account leads Enfield to leap to the conclusion that Hyde is blackmailing his benefactor. 
Utterson. There's a quotation there to describe him. The last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. It is important that Utterson, so respectable, is known for his willingness to remain friends with people whose reputations have been damaged or ruined. This implies that he is not only a person who values charity, but also he is intrigued by the darker side of the world. It is his curiosity that leads him to investigate Mr Hyde. Utterson is a rationalist without a superstitious bone in his body. One of the central themes of the novel is the clash between Victorian rationalism and the supernatural and Utterson emerges as the representation of this rationality. He's always searching out a logical explanation for events and he always dismisses the supernatural. More detail on Utterson. He's the voice of reason. He's reliable and rational. We can trust him as the narrator. Stevenson reveals his character, including how he looks and what um, he acts like. His appearance is, quotation, rugged. He avoids showing his emotions. And when people first meet him, he appears, quotation, lean, long, dusty, dreary. But then it is revealed that he is, quotation, somehow lovable. Remember in this unseen exam, we've got to try and remember short quotations where possible. I'm going to move now on to Hyde. Hyde. His name is a homophone and actually subtly reveals his secret, as in Hyde, to hide something. Quotation, there is something wrong with appearance. I never saw a man I so disliked and yet I scarce know why. He must be deformed somewhere. He gives a strong feeling of deformity, although I couldn't specify the point. So if we look at that quotation... Look at the fact that he's he's disliked. We've got the word deformity as well and deformed. We can use one word quotations. So this quotation suggests that Hyde's ugly, ugliness isn't physical but supernatural. It's something that is attached to his soul more than his body. Enfield and Lady Utterson, whose minds are not suited to the supernatural, can sense this but they can't describe it. And their limited imaginations feel them as they approach the inexplicable and as the rational clashes with the irrational and language breaks down. Another quote. He's an extraordinary looking man and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. Got some more details about Hyde on the next slide. I have repeated the top quotation again just so you remember it. He is presented as unnatural when he obviously immediately tramples the girl. He must be deformed somewhere. Try and remember that. Enfield also says, There is something wrong with his appearance. Something displeasing. Something downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked. And yet I scarce know why. So look at the alliteration as well in displeasing and downright detestable. It almost sounds violent. When Describe and Hyde trampling the girl were told it was like some damn juggernaut. Look at the imagery of juggernaut and what again that implies when analysing language. Something unstoppable, something very powerful, beyond natural. Obviously we, it is a suggestion that he's evil. The doctor also reacts in the following way. Sick and white with the desire to kill him. And the women also wanted to kill him and are described as wild as harpies. And look at that simile. So there's quite a few quotations there to remember in regards to the character of Hyde. The importance of the door. It leads Enfield to tell his story. It is out of place in the street. It is battered, peeling paint. And the street is quite attractive with, quote, freshly painted shutters, well polished brasses and general cleanliness and gaiety. And the door is the first glimpse of Jackal's laboratory. It is a, quotation, sinister block of building. It shows signs of neglect. Tramps are outside of the building and it appears that no one 
cares for it. This disturbing presentation of the building becomes more important as the novella progresses and it is like Jekyll. It has two contrasting aspects. What do we learn about Enfield? Is He's a well-known man about town. He doesn't like to ask questions. Quotation. You start a question and it's like starting a stone. You sit quietly on the top of a hill and away the stones goes, starting others. Again, look at the simile. It's like starting a stone. He clearly doesn't like anything predictable and this suggests he likes to be in control. Before we move to chapter two, I thought we'd finish with another really important quotation and that's as follows. Yes, it's really long. Don't expect it all to be remembered. Try and remember little bits. And it's the introduction to Mr Utterson. Mr Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of a rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. Cold, scanty and embarrassed in discourse. Backward in sentiment. Lean, long, dusty, dreary and yet somehow lovable. He was a stay with himself drank gin when he was alone to mortify a taste for vintages and though he enjoyed the theatre had not crossed the doors of one for twenty years but he had an approved tolerance for others sometimes wondering almost with envy at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds and in any extremity inclined to help rather, to rather than to reprove it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of down-going men. So again, try to remember either single word quotations from this or short, sh sh short sharp quotations that can be used in a question about Utterson. We're going to move to chapter two now. Chapter two. What happens in chapter two is basically as follows. Utterson reads Dr. Jekyll's will. It says that if Jekyll dies or disappears, then Hyde shall take over his life and possessions. Utterson visits Dr. Lanyon, who knows Jekyll well, and he hasn't heard of Hyde. He reveals that he doesn't speak to Jekyll anymore because they fell out ten years ago. And this was before Jekyll developed ideas that Lanyon thought were unscientific. Utterson then suffers some troubled dreams and decides that he has to go and see Hyde himself. He waits by the doors and then sees Hyde and he finds him to be repulsive exactly like Enfield said. Utterson then goes to Jekyll's house and the servant Poole says that they all have instructions to obey Hyde and that he has a key to Jekyll's laboratory. Utterson is convinced that Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll and he decides to find out some secret about Hyde and his life so that he can protect Jekyll. The importance of the chapter. We find out about the will, which is at the centre of Jekyll and Hyde's relationship. We meet Lanyon and find out about the disagreement with Jekyll over differing views on science. We see firsthand that Hyde is repulsive. The idea that Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll is introduced and we get the quotation, if he be Mr Hyde, I shall be Mr Seek, which again subtly refers to the homophone Hyde. In Utterson's dreams, the faceless figure of Hyde stalks the city, quote, it was but to see glide more stealthily through sleeping houses or move the more swiftly through wider labyrinths of lamplighted city and at every street corner crush a child and leave her screaming. In Utterson's dreams, Hyde appears omnipresent, pervading the city with his dark nature and his crimes. This idea of Hyde as a universal presence suggests that this faceless figure crushing children and standing by Jekyll's bed symbolises all the secret sins that lurk beneath the surface of the respectable London. But the crimes remain shrouded in mystery. Science is at the forefront of this chapter when we hear about the disagreement. 
that Lanyon and Jekyll disagree over science because Lanyon believes Jekyll's ideas are, quote, too fanciful. The novella questions the nature of science. Can science involve the mind and spirit, which is what Jekyll believes? More detail on Hyde. Utterson reacts to Hyde in the following way. Unknown disgust, loathing and fear. Remember that quotation. We get another quote. God bless me, the man seems hardly human. Try and remember that. Something, I'm never going to pronounce that word. Troglodic, shall we say? Or can it be the old story of Dr. Fell? Or is it the mere radiance of a foul soul that thus transpires through and transfigures its clear continent? And that word means a person who lived in a cave in prehistoric times. Utterson carries and claims that he sees Satan's signature on Hyde's face. Again, look at the alliteration. Remember that quote. Satan's the devil. So again, we have the suggestion of someone evil. The reference of Dr. Fell is a nursery rhyme about a person who is disliked for no reason. We are again given the impression that Hyde is something or someone awful. Jekyll's house. The house is in a street of houses which used to be grand but are now run down and neglected. But Jekyll's house has a quotation, a great air of wealth and comfort. The hall is the pleasantest room in London. But, and this is important, the house is connecting to the old, connected to the old dissecting room, which is beyond the door Hyde used. Jekyll's house has a, is a dual aspect like Jekyll himself. The dissecting room where dead bodies used to be cut contrast with the hall and an ominous shadow is cast over Jekyll's house. So again, this idea of duality. The house has this dual aspect of this pleasant air of wealth and comfort, but it is joined to a dissecting room. So the house almost symbolises Jekyll and Hyde. Quick, short, key quotations to remember about Hyde are as follows. Mr Hyde was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. Or sneered aloud. Or with a hissing intake of breath. Or a savage laugh. Again, short quotations we can analyse if we get a question on Hyde. I shall move to chapter three now, and that is the last chapter I'll analyse in this video. What happens in chapter three is basically this. Utterson goes to Jekyll's house for dinner and he tries to discuss the will. Jekyll tries to change the subject to his dislike of Lanyon. He offers to help Jekyll escape from Hyde. Jekyll refuses to talk about the subject, claiming he can be rid of Hyde if he wants. He demands that if anything happens to him, Utterson must look after Hyde's interests and Utterson has no choice and agrees. The importance of the chapter is that we see Jack Jekyll in person. The divide between Lanyon and Jekyll is reinforced, but this time we see Jekyll's side instead. Jekyll reveals clues about his relationship with Hyde. They don't make much sense to us at this moment in time, but when we look back at the end of the book, it appears that Jekyll thought he was in control of the situation. Dr Jekyll so far we've had two accounts of him and Lanyon's account was unfavourable and Enfield's was favourable. Now we get the narrator's account. Quote, a large, well-made, smooth-faced man of 50 with something of a slyish cast, perhaps, but every mark of capacity and kindness. Now this description suggests he is sly and that suggests there's something devious about him and therefore we get this hint of his duality and the contrasting aspects of his duality and, and of sorry the contrasting the contrasting aspects of his personality. 
Jekyll criticises Lanyon. Quote, a hidebound pedant, an ignorant, blatant pedant, I was never more disappointed in any more any man than in Lanyon. Pedant here is someone who is particular about details and the accuracy of facts. Hidebound is someone that is restricted in their views. So obviously Jekyll is suggesting that Lanyon's views of traditional science are restricted. But we are forced to wonder whether Hyde is always on Jekyll's mind, even when he tries to relax, because it's almost like a play on words. Hidebound suggests that Jekyll is bound to Hyde and therefore controlled by Hyde. And the last thing to say in this video is about Jekyll's will. Because Jekyll refers to dying and disappearing quite a few times. And this acts as a possible instance of foreshadowing. Is it foreshadowing what's going to happen to Jekyll? And the quotes I've outlined are, If I am taken away, when I am no longer here, disappearance or unexplained absence. So perhaps Jekyll is always worried about the influence of Hyde and that is why his will outlines these worries. Okay, I hope this video has been useful. Please check out the videos that will follow which will be on the other chapters and good luck in your English literature exams.